What do budget hotels and the International Space Station have in common? According to astronaut Scott Kelly, the answer is mediocre Wi-Fi. He describes the internet on the ISS as, quote, worse than what dial-up was like. This piqued my curiosity since I began to wonder just where does the ISS get its internet from? You see, space, well, it's way up there. And as far as I know, you can't just run an ethernet cable from Johnson Space Center up to the ISS. Even if you could, I wouldn't recommend it. Trust me, you do not want grandma's kitchen destroyed by an ethernet cable wrapping around the earth at orbital velocities. Plus, where would you even get a cable that's infinitely long? Okay, 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 I hear you. Get back to reality already and give us the answer. When an astronaut sends data to Earth, the ISS first sends a radio signal the wrong way up to one of 10 geostationary satellites. Those satellites, called TDRS, or Tracking and Data Relay Satellites, are orbiting about 23,000 miles above the ISS. In turn, these relay the signals from the ISS to ground stations on Earth. From those ground stations, plain old internet cables carry the data to NASA facilities. If data needs to be sent to the ISS, the reverse happens. But even with all that, the journey isn't over when visiting websites or using social media from orbit. You see, astronauts don't use their laptops to connect directly to the internet. I don't blame them. Nobody wants their computer infected with advertisements for tacky vacations and secret ways to save on car insurance. Instead, they use a remote connection to control another computer that's down on Earth. This computer is the actual connection to the internet, and it acts as a sort of firewall for hacking or viruses, keeping the laptop in orbit safe. So you're probably asking, just what do the astronauts do with their extraterrestrial internet? Basically everything we do on the internet. When they aren't scrolling through the latest memes or photos of cute farm animals, they check their email, have a weekly movie night, update their social media, watch live TV, call or video chat loved ones, and even check their bank accounts. However, it should be noted that NASA does hold them to the same computer use standards as any terrestrial employee. Now I have to imagine that Mr. Kelly was probably pretty thankful for the connection he did have. You see, astronauts didn't always have access to the internet. It wasn't until January 22, 2010, that NASA officially connected the ISS to the internet at large. Before that, they only had email, voice calls, and limited video teleconferencing. By now, I'm sure someone is already furiously typing away in the comments, something like, I see tweets from astronauts posted before 2010. You obviously don't know what you're talking about. Hold on, wait. Before you click the comment button, there's actually an interesting tidbit here. Before gaining access to the internet, astronauts were tweeting, but it was done by proxy. Whenever they felt the urge to post on social media, an astronaut would type up their tweet in an email. Then they sent the email to a person in mission control who would post it on their behalf. As long as I'm trying to head off comments before they happen, no, the title isn't clickbait. The ISS does in fact have a Wi-Fi router that their laptops and iPads connect to. As a side note, if anyone knows the name of this network, I'd love to know. I couldn't find it. Drop it down in the comments. Now, if you're an infrastructure nerd like me, you may have wondered, just how fast is this internet connection? Well, peak throughput tops out at about 300 megabits per second, or roughly two to three times faster than the average US home internet connection. However, average speeds are more along the lines of 50 megabits per second for downloading data and three megabits per second for uploading it. So you might be asking yourself, if the astronaut's internet is so fast, why do they say it's slow like dial-up? Well, not all of that speed is available for their private use. Remember, they also work where they live. Since they regularly need to transfer experimental data and download new procedures, not all of that connection is available for streaming the latest episode of The Great British Bake Off. Furthermore, the ISS is orbiting the Earth about every 90 minutes, meaning what internet they do have is pretty spotty. Basically, it works for 45 to 50 minutes of every hour. Add to that the problem of high latency. Latency is essentially how long it takes to get a reply from a message that you send. Their latency is so high because the signal travels first the wrong way, then back to Earth, 
and then across the globe if necessary. This usually means over half a second delay between clicking a link and the next web page starting to load. I can't speak for everyone, but I know plenty of drivers that will honk at my car if I'm not moving the instant the traffic light turns green, let alone half a second later. Currently, there are some promising improvements to their connection. This year, astronauts installed a new UK-designed antenna that will connect to the European Space Agency's network of satellites. This network, called EDRS, or European Data Relay System, is a separate set of ground stations and geostationary satellites. The connection is predicted to provide an additional 50 megabits per second download and 2 megabits per second upload, not to mention the additional safety of a redundant connection. Another promising development is an optical laser interlink between the Earth and the ISS. Nicknamed OPALS, or Optical Payload for Lasercom Science, the experiment aims to increase the ISS's communication speeds by a factor of 10 to 100. Commence the frickin' laser beam scene from Austin Powers. If only I had the budget. The OPALS prototype has been an integral part of researching laser data transmission since it began operating in June of 2014. At the moment, the system isn't as reliable as the current radio wave-based communications, mainly due to the inability of the laser to penetrate dense cloud cover. While most instances of the experiment were able to successfully send a test video by repeating it multiple times, downlinks from the ISS ultimately ended up failing whenever cloud cover increased. Still, one day this technology could drastically increase the bandwidth available to space stations, the moon, or even other planets. So, the next time you stay at a hotel that has subpar Wi-Fi, try not to get so frustrated. Instead, imagine you're an astronaut on the International Space Station. Maybe it'll help. Maybe it won't. After that, I suppose feel free to continue cursing out the underpaid staff at the front desk.